And Jasmine, let me know when I have three minutes left. I, I will do. Excellent. I will <laughs> speak quickly. I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited to hear everything you have to say. So we will all be enraptured. Uh, all right, everybody, thank you for, for sticking around. We are really excited to hear now from Terry Murray about her um, path to where she is now as an honorary biophysicist. Yes, I call myself an honorary <laughs> biophysicist. I was very pleased to be asked, and I actually do not do biophysics, but um, let me tell you how I got to where I am. So uh, very much like David Nelson, um, I traveled all around the world. Um, before age 18, I lived um, in Japan, Pakistan, Germany, Japan, South Korea, Germany, and Indonesia um, with um, some um, uh, with some I'm beginning to have the same troubles you were, David, with um, two years of high school in Washington, DC, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, but the rest of the time, either my mother taught me or I went to um, army schools. The, my father was a diplomat and every time there was a war, he went into um, service in the army reserve. So both my parents were artists. My father graduated from Yale, which is why he became a diplomat. Um, and so I took um, painting and dance. That's me dancing at age five in Pakistan. Um, and I still love to paint, but I, I wanted to be an artist. But in Virginia, my first two years of high school, my father was in Saigon during the war in the embassy. Um, my first interest in science broke through because I had a fantastic chemistry teacher, Mr. Morris. I decided then to be a scientist and do art as a hobby. But then I moved to Seoul, Korea, and the, there was no physics in high school. So I read physics on my own. And how did I get into physics? Well, my big brother, John, who was nine years older than me, came to Seoul, and there we are eating dinner. And he told me he was, uh, uh, when we were in Pakistan, he was sent to high school in the States because there really was no high school he could go to. And he was a product of Sputnik and decided to go to MIT in physics. So when he came to Seoul to talk to me, I was applying to graduate to uh, undergraduate school. He said, there is absolutely no way I could do physics and would not be able to hack MIT. So I applied to MIT and I applied to Caltech and I got a postcard back from Caltech saying, we do not admit women. And I got a letter back from MIT saying, you are admitted. So I had to go. So that's how I got into physics at MIT. It was on a dare. Uh, unbeknownst to me, the year I was a freshman at MIT was the beginning of the undergraduate research opportunities program. And like my chemistry lab in sophomore year in high school, I really loved labs, so I got um, freshman year, for the, for the next four years, I, I worked in a lab and it was fantastic. Um, I, I got a um, bachelor's in physics. Um, there were three women out of a hundred um, bachelors in physics. Then I went around looking at graduate schools and I really decided I wanted to stay at MIT because Things were very fast paced there. 
So um, I started out building complex apparatus, working on superfluid helium and then surface physics. I built my own ultra high vacuum system. Um, I, I used the lathe. I, I built the ultra high vacuum flanges. I did all the plumbing. I did all the electrical work. That's when I realized I actually love engineering. And so I asked my advisor, Tom Graytech, how about doing a summer in industry? I was on an NSF, a, a, um, IBM fellowship, and how about it? And he was quite flabbergasted and actually fell off his chair. Um, but the next day he walked into my office and said, you should go to Bell Labs. So that's how I got to Bell Labs. I did a summer internship. I absolutely loved it. I was then recruited by Bell Labs and I knew by that time I didn't want to go anywhere else. So I spent the first nine years and uh, interacted with David Nelson on uh, colloidal systems, hexatic phases, and doing fundamental condensed matter physics, statistical physics, it was fantastic. But I accidentally became a manager. And that is because Doug Oshroff, who was my department head at the time, decided to go off to Caltech because his wife got a very um, a vice president um, position at Genentech. So Paul Fleury, his manager, came to talk to me and said, how would you like to be a department head? And my first reaction was, oh my God, no way. But I went home and thought about it and I realized who would be department head if I wasn't. Then I decided I wanted to make the decisions. So that's how I became a department head. But that turned out to be wonderful. I was head of three different departments learning all sorts of stuff. The kind of research that was done at Bell Labs was everything from where I started out, which was fundamental, to really good material synthesis, characterization, processing devices and components up to systems and products. Um, and there was complete feedback between them. But Bell Labs had a very complex history and it would take about a year to go through all of this. So just follow the arrows and you can see that it was a, it was a complicated place. But I showed up as a summer student in 76. I became, and that was Bell Telephone Laboratories Incorporated, part of the Bell System Monopoly. Um, in 1978, I became a member of technical staff. Um, then I, nine years later, I became a department head, I was department head of a number of different departments. Um, and then um, I became a vice president and then I became a senior vice president. Um, and I stopped my own research at that point. And I will tell you why in a minute. Um, but uh, that was when uh, Lucent Technologies uh, spun off. And I, as senior vice president and vice president did much of the um, work on connecting research to business units. Most of that was the software. So I had to learn a whole lot about technology and software and network transport layers. And Carrie, hey, I'll, I'll give you a, a three minute warning now. Okay, so this is what happened, which is why I, um, if you look at the revenues of losing technologies when went very negative when the stock price went from 60 to 53 cents. Um, and we then had to, that was a WorldCom, if you remember that, we had to spin out um, 
business units. And I was a lot of that. I had to decide where the research part of the uh, business would move. Um, then I went to Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I was recruited there. Um, the only thing I'm gonna say about that is uh, right in the middle of my five years at uh, Livermore, there was a contract competition. So I got to write a $14 billion proposal. I wrote the science part. Uh, we won, but that was a difficult decision because there was budget cuts and massive layoffs. Um, then I was recruited to Harvard um, in a school that was spinning off from in a very um, tumultuous divorce from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I had a great time there, but no time to tell you about it. Um, and that was the year I was APS president. After I stepped down from being Dean, I spent two years in the Obama administration, which I really loved. I was director of the Office of Science, but spent a lot of time thinking about energy and of course, nuclear safety and security. And now I am very, very interested in the environment. Um, Biosphere 2, I'm the research director does a mass of ecological research and working on sustainable development goals and solutions. Um, so I was appointed um, co-chair of the 10 member group for science, technology and innovation to attain the sustainable development goals. Um, so uh, here, here are my um, suggestions. Don't be afraid to try new things. Always look forwards, not backwards. Most big decisions, and certainly in my life, were unplanned or just completely accidental. And however, be prepared in order to take advantage of opportunities. So thank you. Thanks so, so much. Uh, we don't have a ton of time, but I'll, oh, uh, I see that Tim has his hand raised, so. Sherry, I was at Bell Murray Hill in uh, 77 to 81. I uh -huh. did a physical research lab under Brinkman with uh, James Stamatoff and um, Peter Eisenberger. Cool. And, uh, I don't think I knew you at the time, but uh, I just want to emphasize it really was a fantastic place. It was absolutely fantastic. Almost yes. impossible to visualize from my. Yeah. So and, and, thanks, and for your, thanks for your talk. You know, pe people ask me what I like doing best, and it was research at Bell Labs. That's great. Um, we maybe have time for, for one more question. I noticed that Barbara has her hand raised, um, so please. Uh, hi, Cherry. Uh, so hi. you mentioned uh, <laughs> you mentioned at one point that at, you stopped research and you stopped science and you said you'd go into that. But of course, you ran out of time. I was wondering if yes. you could take a minute to say at what point do you did you decide that uh, and why? Yeah, uh, well, stop um, yes, that? I I continued doing research in my lab with a postdoc um, until my postdoc left and went to Singapore. Um, and we were doing layoffs of uh, a layoff every two weeks um, in the research area. And I was finding people jobs in, in um, universities. And I, I just felt like I couldn't hire myself another postdoc at that point. So I shut my lab down. Um, Thank you. Because, because I was working with the business units. And that, that was fun too, actually. Thank you very much. All right, um, thank you so much, Cherry, for, for that really great and, and diverse talk about so many different things that you, you've been doing. Um, with, if anybody has more questions, please please put them in the chat, of course, and, and maybe Cherry will get, 
to them during the, the rest of this happy hour. Uh, with that, I'll pass it to Sean.